Welcome to the Muleshoe Public Library. My name is Diane, and we have a speaker today, and her name is Eldrina Duma. She is a Native American storyteller. She now resides in the area of Amarillo and Canyon, Texas. She is a former classroom teacher turned professional storyteller, and she continues to educate as she travels throughout the United States, sharing stories, teaching and encouraging the use of imagination, creative thinking, and writing. She is brought to us by a grant from the Texas Commission of Arts in Austin, Texas. Please give a warm welcome to Eldrina Duma, storyteller. The Native American people, remember I was talking about the, the mass slaughter that took place in Rath County. Um, there were many tribes, as I researched some of their stories, they were looking for the bison. They always knew what areas to go to to hunt because the bison would be found there. But as they were going to these certain spots, they were finding that they were nowhere to be found. They didn't understand what was going on. And so they just kept moving and kept moving and they tried to look for their trails because when the bison moved, they just, they just chopped, they stomped down everything. You could see where they grazed, but they kept looking. And one incident told of a hunter, several of them, they could smell the bison before they saw it. They smelled something putrid in the air. They couldn't understand what it was. And then they came over the hill, and down below, they were just heartbroken, shocked. They couldn't believe it. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dead bison just left to rot across the land. Their skin taken from them, sometimes their whole heads, their tongues were all taken, certain parts of them were taken, but there was absolutely no way that they could butcher as many bison as they were killing a day. Some of the best hunters were killing over 20 bison a day. A good hunter could kill about 100 within a morning time. Because in the afternoon, they said, was when they, they used that time to go ahead and take what they needed from the bison that they killed. Well, if you kill that many bison, there's, you know, it doesn't matter how many buffalo hunters are out there, you're just not going to have enough to take care of all the butchering. And so the railroad kind of went down, they put the hides and stuff on uh, wagons, and they took them to the nearest railroad, and they shipped them out. Um, just recently I was reading where there was a country overseas that came up with a machine that could actually tan the hides of the bison. And so that country was requesting a lot of hides. And they were being shipped um, first by railroad and then um, shipped across the oceans to the country. And so they were tanning them and using the leather for all sorts of things. Now, you can get very complicated with machines, but the Native American people did not have machines. They were blessed with a mind. They were blessed with creativity and imagination. It was given to them, like they said, by the great mystery. And so they were utilized. There are several stories that say that they were given information and dreams of how to use certain things, whether it was herbs, um, animals, all kinds of things. They were given that information. I received this box um, from up north. There's a tribe up there that is an organization that is bringing back the bison across the United States. And I went to their website um, and got this box from them. It's made out of bison hide, and um, it is strung together. All of the corners are put together with the hide of the bison, and inside came certain items. I'm gonna pass these around. This is a, the fur of a bison. You can perhaps pass that around. Uh, this right here, you can tell, 
where they're tanning it, taking the, the fur off. This is loose fur. I got this from the Charles Goodnight um, people there. I was telling them what I do, that I travel, and she said, why don't you go outside? We have a barrel out there that are bison. They're constantly shedding, and we go and get their fur because we weave um, their fur into gloves, hats, um, socks, and I bought some socks, and, and they are very comfortable. And so this is their loose fur. They just go ahead and get it, and then they kind of clean it up because they have burrs and everything. But the bone of the bison is used as a scraper to scrape that hair off. The women were very good at doing this. You can just lay it right there. Thank you. So I'm going to pass these three things around. So you can kind of take a look at how soft it is when it's tanned very good. One of my relatives back on the reservation at um, the village that I come from, he was the tanner of our deer hides, and he would always use the brain. The brain is a, a tanning, um, they use the brain to tan it with. It kind of stinks, but it gets it really soft. And then, here's the tail. You can use this as the flies come around, just like the bison do when the flies and mosquitoes are biting them and you can use it to shoo things away. Um, so you can take a look at that. This is a bladder that was made into a pouch. The person that would make this pouch would be the women. A lot of times this is where they kept their quills and their awls that they used. Now this one is um, a little bit bigger. It's, so you could kind of, when this is wet, you could use this to kind of put holes in it, but it would have to be wet in order to do that. Now this one is bigger. They would have smaller ones that they would use and to poke holes in their leather. And then the porcupine quills are gathered and used by the ladies. And they make, um, they adorn their clothes with it and make jewelry out of it. And so you can kind of take a look. This was all handmade. And I think this is a scrotum. <laughs> so uh, they uh, used all kinds of things. They used the stomach of the bison to put water and carry things in. Um, yeah, just put it right there. They could um, boil water in some of the, the stomachs and everything. They just kind of hoisted it over the, um, cut not too close to the fire, but it would be close enough to where sometimes they would heat up the rocks and then put the hot rocks into the water and it would help heat up the, the water also that way. Um, this right here are some of the teeth that are made into necklaces. A lot of times um, different tribes will use different kinds of teeth to adorn their clothing, especially the women's dresses. A lot of times they use the elk teeth. And then here is the horn of a bison. You can kind of take a closer look. Imagine what that could be used for. And this, um, there's all kinds of things. Once this dries up, it becomes so hard that you can imagine what they could use these for. It's um, just the thicker part of the hide. And it's very, very heavy and thick. Um, see, here are, I think these were kind of like little, those um, toys where you, you go like this and they try, kind of go back and forth. I did not master this, so you know it's kind of like something that they could just kind of put on your finger. And then as you do this, they kind of go back and forth. This one usually grosses out the kids. And this is the buffalo chip. And usually the kids are going, ew! It's like this was their fuel. Yes. Sometimes wood was hard to come by on the plains. 
So as long as the bison was there, they would gather it up and keep it on supply because they never knew when they were going to come across some more of the wood. Now, um, this is just a small a child's um, bow and arrow. Some of the bows and arrows that are used, they were a lot bigger and stronger, but this was pretty much what was used. You could, you could just imagine if you used a bow and arrow to go and hunt, the skill level that you had to have. And so there were always these games, always things that always um, kind of tried to get them to be better aim and better shots at whatever they were going to use it for. And the children, it started young. And of course, I'm sure they were told, now watch where you point that arrow. <laughs> and then the sinew was used in sewing. You could tell where it's fibrous. And then they just rolled it up to make it stronger. And they used it for sewing things, putting things together. So you can kind of take a look at that. I have um, a necklace here that comes from the San Domingo people. And traditionally, whenever um, they made their necklaces, they always used the sinew um, to put them together. I love the traditional old ways of the necklaces. They don't use any of the silver or any, any um, wire or anything. This is just the natural way of using it. And so whenever I come across the sinew like that, um, it is very strong. Like this right here is strong. They also have kind of like a, an imitation one too that they have nowadays that they use. So it's used for all kinds of things. Now. Um, Let's go ahead and finish up some of the pictures here. Now, one of the things that they say, you know, I never can understand this. When, when you see people going to Yellowstone or maybe even Caprock Canyons because they have a huge herd there too. But I don't know what it is about people. Um, sometimes they don't use their brains. They, they look at these big animals and they say, oh, look how cute that is. And they get out and they, they want to get closer, to get a closer picture. And those bison, they don't want anybody coming near them. And so, just for your information, if you ever get close to a bison and you see that tail come up, you better get out of there because that tail is warning you that they're getting ready to come after somebody. And so, um, usually their tail, the position of their tail, will let them know, let you know what's going on. If they're just kind of flickering it, uh, they're relaxed. There's no stress going on. They're not bothered by you. But once that tail comes up, um, you can bet that they're going to be really upset. Okay. Now, the Wind Cave National Park herd um, was revived, and some of the herd uh, back in 1905, the American Bison Society um, and also, I guess, the New York City Zoo, they went ahead and sent some bison to this national park um, to help restore the bison herds. So these herds, several uh, numbers were, were sent out across the country because they were really hoping that they would not lose this great animal. Um, the numbers had dwindled so much that they were afraid that the bison was never going to be seen in this area. And so a lot of times some of the tribes were already capturing some of the, the smaller ones and uh, bringing them onto their tribal lands and raising them uh, just for that preservation part of it. Okay. And then um, some people, you know, they're, they're just fast. But they're also good swimmers. Um, they say that. So once they get in the water, don't think it's going to slow them down. It, they can ju go just as fast in the water. And they are um, apparently they like to jump fences too. So okay. And let's see. Their eating, of course, is a lot. A lot of the things that are around them. They're the plants that that grow around them. That's pretty much what they eat. Um, you can go ahead and turn it again. Now, Teddy Roosevelt, um, when he went out on his excursions, 
and he saw the vast land and the beauty, um, he must have really gained something from that retreat of going out into the land. And he would come across the bison. And when he started to see nature and the animals in it, there's something within him that decided we need to do something to preserve this land and the animals that are in it, the birds that are in it. And so he's kind of credited for helping um, create a lot of uh, things that would save um, land and the animals that are in it. And so um, even though he was for saving it, whenever there was something that came to Washington to be voted on, um, a lot of them didn't agree. And so, like, uh, say for example, New Mexico voted to um, protect the bison. But it said New Mexico didn't have any bison. <laughs> and so it's kind of like you're protecting something you don't have. But maybe they foresaw something because now the tribes in New Mexico, they have bison herds. So maybe they were foreseeing a time that would come that, that their, their words would mean something. Okay. And then it talked about how long they live. They can live up to 20 years. And it talked about breeding, uh, male and female. Look how beautiful they are, though. Yeah. Aren't they just beautiful coming at you? They're just, they're just, there's just something about them. And that hump was a, a delicacy. A lot of times the hunters would save that part for themselves because that was just the most tenderest thing um, that they say is on that bison. Okay. And of course they, they either are um, marking their area when they're mating or trying to get the bugs to get off their, their hide. So you'll see them roaming around like that too, rolling around. All right. Now, um, like I, I was talking about how some of them are known, they say that there was their ancestors crossed over what we call the Bering Strait from Asia, and that uh, quite possibly uh, there was a group that came from that area and started to migrate down into our uh, northern uh, American area, or uh, yeah, so Anyway, uh, we never, I guess we won't know where they all come from. But I was just reading just recently that there was a, there was a bison, um, I don't know what the name of it, that's my, sorry, <laughs> that's my um, timer. Um, there was a bison that was found, was frozen for, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of years, and it was brought up. And they, as they were looking at it, they're thinking that it was already going to die anyway because as they looked at it, a lot of the area in the neck and underneath showed um, signs of starvation. But everything was intact, inside and outside. They had it on its back, so you couldn't really see its face or anything, but it, it did look like it was not, um, of course it was frozen all these years. but they were able to um, kind of look at it a little bit closer and see even what was in its um, stomach and intestines and everything like that, what it had eaten. And it didn't seem like it ate very much. Okay. And then take a, <laughs> they say this one is nearsighted. I really like this one because it looks like it's really reading something up close. Now, what did they say about us? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then it talks about how they communicate, how they make the, the pig-like grunts and stuff. All right, I think we're finished with, with that. And so what I want to do right now is to kind of share a little bit about um, the people. You know, we're talking about the different bisons, um, the stories and stuff. As you go throughout the library and you look out there, I already talked about some of the books and um, how, you know, I didn't appreciate them when I first saw them, but now I do. Nowadays, um, a lot of people are going back into research. They're looking at interviews of tribes of people that once lived. And over and over and over again, 
they saw what they grew up in being lost. I mean, we even experience that today, don't we? When we think back about how things are happening so fast that we're losing things that we grew up with, that we cherish today, but maybe we didn't cherish then. But over and over again, many of the stories that are told, like, I don't know if you've ever heard of a woman by the name of Sarah Woman, Woman, Womanaka, but she is from the um, Paiute tribe. And I don't know if you have this book in your library. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful book because she was an advocate for the people. The, as the soldiers were coming onto the land, they used her as an interpreter because she went to California to school. Her grandfather wanted her to get a little bit of education because he saw, he saw what was going to happen. He saw that change was coming. But before that, she talks about this. She said that when her grandfather first heard of the first white man coming to their land, she said he got so excited. He was so excited, he called all of the, the guys that, um, that went with him wherever, and he said, let's go greet them. Our brothers are here, they, they've come. Because story had told about their white brothers coming back to be with them. A long time ago, there was a story that talked about the separation between the white and the brown people. But they were all brothers and sisters at one time. And then they went their way, and the Native American people stayed, knowing that a time would come when they were going to return. And so he heard those stories growing up. And as old as he was, he remembered it. And he longed for, for that day to come when his white brothers would return. So he was all excited. You see, he thought that they had the same story too, but when he went down there and the, the white men were coming onto the land, they had already heard about the savages, you know? They're gonna kill you, and uh, they're gonna kill all your family too. Well, many of the tribes, that wasn't their thinking. A lot of them had stories of coming together once again with their white brothers and sisters. And so he went down to go greet them happily. And, and they basically said, stop. He was confused. He didn't understand. But, but I'm your brother. Didn't you come? Didn't you, aren't you here because you're coming back to us? They didn't understand what he was saying. All they knew was that he was uh, an Indian and, um, and they didn't know him. So they kept their distance, he said and they followed them to make sure that they were safe in this land that was tame to them, but wild to the newcomers. He was kind of disappointed because he went back home and he was sad. He didn't understand why his white brothers didn't greet him in a happy way or embrace the fact that they were coming back together. And Sarah talks about my poor grandfather even to the time of his dying days, he said to his people, as long as I am living, you treat our white brothers with like a neighbor. You treat them in a good way and do not ever hurt them because they are our relatives. And so as long as he was alive, his people respected it. Now, the Paiutes, they covered a large piece of area, most of the state of probably Nevada into Idaho, probably into some part of what we now know as Washington, Oregon, that area. They covered a large area. They were the northern and the southern. But he had all of the, most of them were his people. And so he protected them. And Sarah followed in his footsteps. When the cavalry, when the military forces came, and they were bringing people that were supposed to take care of the groups. They weren't doing their job. 
food was coming for the native people that they were placing on what we now know as reservations, but the people weren't getting the food. The officers, the ones in charge, were taking it and selling it for their own gain. So the people were starving. Sometimes they would send blankets and everything for the people to use during the winter months because they no longer had the bison to rely on. They no longer had the animals that they were used to getting. And so they, it was getting too cold. And so the, the blankets weren't coming to them. So Sarah decided that she had a task to do. She had to make her way to Washington, D.C. to let the people there know what was going on in her country. And that's where she met um, some important people that helped her write this story. And she is known as the first Native American woman to write a story in English. And she had the help of two women. You get this book, find out who those two women are. You will know them. And so look it up, Amazon or whatever. But Sarah's story is wonderful. Her state honored her by placing a statue in the statue hall in Washington, D.C. Her statue is there. And so um, learn a little bit more about her. Now, we're coming to an end. And I want to ask, is there any questions that anybody has out there for me? before I create a story. Make sure this is canceled. Anybody? Yeah, ma'am. Do you know how many of y'all's families and everything that are still living and... Like my family? Yes. Yes. Um, you know, that's kind of funny because I grew up among the Pueblo people of New Mexico and Arizona. And so our language was all around us. I mean, we were surrounded growing up with our traditional language and our traditions and ceremonies, dances. Um, we live in the Pueblo houses. Uh, the Spaniards came to the land and when they saw our communities, because they were communities, they called that, those villages Pueblos. They called our houses adobe because that was what they were familiar with. It was their language. Even the mountains that were cut off flat on top, they called them mesas. So we use a lot of words that the Spaniards first brought years ago when they came to this land. But they brought, um, they brought things that, uh, that were not good for the Pueblo people. The Pueblo people were very happy to have them. Once again, a lot of the tribes were always happy to welcome people that were, um, that were different than they were. They always fed them. They made sure that they were okay, comfortable, and then they would leave them and then come back and check on them to make sure they're okay. So with our people, we've always been where we have been. Well, I say that. We were a part of the groups that, um, that the ruins that you hear about, like the, like the Mesa Verde and Chaco and all of them. Um, many of our people came from those. But my uncle um, had told me that, that being prayerful people, they did not move until um, they were told or given um, the information to move. Um, whether it was, you know, the rivers drying up and there was no food and water, so maybe this is the time that we have to go and find our final place of living. Because they knew those places were not the final places. And so where we are today is going to be, this is where we've been for ages. And so um, the pueblos in New Mexico all along the Rio Grande, they were there already in place and there were more of them before the Spaniards came. The Spaniards once again also brought diseases that killed a lot of the pueblos off. And then when they revolted because of the treatment that the Spaniards were giving them, they revolted and you can read about that, that's called the Pueblo Revolt. And Pope is um, a Pueblo man that is known in the United States now to be the only person to have ever um, uh, defeated um, kind of like a major, a major group of people, a major country, and he won, and him and his people. But it wasn't for themselves. It was because these people were not 
um, treating their, they were not treating things right. The, um, it was all for themselves, their own gain. And, and that's kind of how wars are too, you know. It's always um, who's going to get the benefit of it all. But the Pueblo people, um, they only fight when they're provoked, um, when they feel it's necessary. It's not the first thing they go for. Um, so among our people though, all of my relatives live back in New Mexico. The, the people I come from are the Goeka people. My mother comes from the Shash Gahanutza, the, the Roadrunner clan. We always introduce our mothers first. And then our father, my father comes from Kulu clan on the Tewa and Hopi in Arizona. And that's the corn clan. Um, his mother, my Saya, means grandmother in Tewa, uh, she gave me one of her names. Um, so my name is uh, Blue Corn. Um, so anyway, that, that is my Indian name. My great-grandmother, Napai, gave us a Laguna name, but my mother couldn't remember it. So um, we, we would either have to be renamed or um, just let it go. So that's kind of what happened. Do you, when y'all get back together and visit and stuff, do you speak the Indian language? or? It is spoken all around me. I'm not fluent. Um, I'm learning gradually. Our tribe this year just recently put the language on our computers, but you have to be a member of our tribe to, in order to get on that um, site. Yeah. And so they are teaching the masses their membership um, because a lot of us live outside of our tribal land of the Lagunas, um, the Pueblo of Laguna in New Mexico. And so all my family still lives back there, and I'm the only one that lives outside. Oh. But my, my father told me, um, I didn't understand his words at the time, he was the Tewa and Hopi, but um, I wasn't dating, and he said, you know, Drina, one day you're going to think about getting married. And I said, Dad, I'm not even dating. And he says, I know, I know, but I'm going to tell you this. And he says, um, I want you to make sure that you find a young man that is respectful. When he takes you to his house, watch how he treats his relatives, especially his mother. If he honors his mother and takes care of her and treats her kind, then you know he's going to do the same for you. But if you go to their house and he talks back, or he is not very helpful, or he treats them terrible and talks bad at them, then no matter how much you think you love him, you get away. Yeah. Because if he can't respect his mother, he's not going to respect you. Good advice. And so I sat there rolling my eyes. <laughs> oh, Dad, you know. And then he said, but I would like for you to marry uh, an Indian man, but if you don't, find one that is a hard worker, but also one that is not stingy of you. Yeah. That whenever you want to bring yourself or your children back to see us, that he will not um, act like a crybaby. <laughs> <laughs> that he will let you come freely and maybe come with you. And so those things I thought about. And it clicked one day when my husband we were uh, met, like I said, at um, in, in Eastern New Mexico University at Portales, and he invited me to come to Amarillo to meet his family. <laughs> and so I did, and the first thing that I noticed was how he greeted his father. Because most men are, are you know, they're just like handshakers, you know, like, yeah, you know, how you doing? <laughs> his mother had uh, passed away when he was in junior high. A car accident. So his father greeted him at the door and he was so excited to see him. Oh my son, my my little boy is in a you know little boy was like <laughs> six three, six four, and a football player and his dad just embraced him and hugged him so tight. And he kissed him on his head and he told him how happy he was to see him again. And that's when my father's words came back to me. Watch, while you're here, watch how he treats his stepmom. Watch how he treats everybody in the household. And he was very respectful. 
And so when I saw my dad, I told him all about it. When I told him that he had asked me to marry him, my dad sat there. I could tell he was, mm -hmm. And I said, Dad, he is so kind and nice. And he can chop wood. <laughs> and he said, oh, well, we'll have to get him out here to chop some wood, see how strong he is. And he did. He put him to work and made him chop wood out there, and he did it in no time flat. And it's kind of like, I think we're going to keep this one. <laughs> I don't have to chop wood if he's around. You know? So anyway, there were little things that, that were given to me along the way. And another thing my father told me is to bring the children home so that they can remember and know who we are. Yeah. You know, their father comes from this land, and you come from this land. We are your people. So when you have your children, you tell them about us. Bring them to us so we can greet them, so we can tell them about this world, because it is very different than out here. I don't even know how to explain that to you. But when I go home, it's like I'm stepping into another place. Yeah. And in a way, I am. Because every federally recognized tribe, if they have tribal land, they are a sovereign nation. So we have nations within a nation. And um, so I'm going to kind of leave that with, with you. And um, I wanted to create a story, but I think we ran out of time. And so we'll just have to save that for another time and then go with it. Um, one of the things that I'm going to leave behind is a book. I'm going to let you decide how okay. to give this out. Okay. This is a story. It's called Sarah's Music. It was written by a, a wonderful Choctaw woman, friend of mine, storyteller. She lives in Oklahoma City. Um, and she's a wonderful, wonderful storyteller. But this is one of the books that she came out um, with last, I think she was here before. Yeah. And I stopped by her house. I said, Stella, I want several of your books because I want to make sure that other people get to um, read your writing. So I'm going to give that to you and you can do with it however you want. And um, I want to thank everybody for coming. One of the things I want you to remember is that even though a long time ago decisions were made to try to get rid of the bison, but just like the American Indian, you know, it's kind of like what they, what they tried to do to several of the tribes, um, they didn't realize the strength of the people. They didn't realize that even though they put us with other tribes in boarding schools, taking the children away from their families, from the, the western coast, sending them all the way to Carlisle to the east. Yeah. Some of these kids never got to see their parents again because they died when they came back home. Mm -hmm. No one was there that they knew. They were raised up. They were tall. They were big. They were men. They were women. Some of the children never made it back home. Mm. And you still see their grave sites at Haskell, Indian Nation, Carlisle, all of these places around. But my uncle always used to say to me, you know, they always told us that we couldn't speak our language. And at nighttime, when you would hear the little ones crying in their beds, we would tell them, shh, we'll sing you a song. Don't cry, you'll get in trouble. And so we would sing songs. And we would learn each other's tribe songs and share stories. And so whenever we went back home, we would share the stories that we heard from the other tribes. And maybe some of them kind of became our story too. Yeah. And so even though the bison was trying to get annihilated, it survived. Yeah. And it's coming back strong. And so today, the meat is sought after. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and if you ever buy anything, any kind of clothing, um, the wool won't make your feet sweat. It actually keeps it dry. So if you work outside on a ranch or a farm in the wintertime, 
you need to go find you some bison socks and gloves. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming. And um, if any of you have an opportunity to let your, your representatives in this area know, um, I'm not exactly sure who is here. Maybe, um, I don't know, Matt Thornberry and um, uh, Sullinger, Sullinger, can there be Cal? Um, there you go. And then uh, is it uh, John Smithy? Is he in this area? Okay. Um, if you have a chance, write a letter to them. Tell them that you're thankful for the Texas Commission on the Arts for um, bringing us out, I mean, to your community. So thanks. Come up and um, see these things a little bit closer. Um, ask me any kind of questions. And I just want you to know that in your library, you may find some of these books. There, this one is illustrated and written by Paul Goebel. He was, he's um, very well known in the Great Plains areas. He writes a lot of their, their stories down, but he illustrates. And this one is a very good book. I like this one. It tells a lot, a variety of things from the Plains tribes. Have that you written a book? I'm sorry? Have you written a book? Have you, have I read your book? No. Have, read, you read, read, have I written a book? I am a part of oh. books. Oh. My children keep saying, are you scared to go and do something on your own? And I said, oh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> so I'm a part of collections. So in this book, it's called Tricksters, there is 20 trickster stories and they're all graphically illustrated. Um, you, if you want one, I have some with me right now, or you can get them on Amazon.com. You can go there. And these are trickster stories from Native American tribes across the country. So there are many different ones. Rabbit, raven, crow, coyote, you know, there's all kinds. Raccoon, all of them. They are um, tricksters in many different tribes. So you can go, you can look through this one right here with the red dot. It's the one that I use for people to flip through and see if it's something you might be interested in. But yes, I'm part of that. And then I also have another one. I think I left it outside. And it's a kind of a children's collection of a, a yeah. book. I wrote a story called Balancing the Moon. So yes. how old are your children? Uh, let me see. My oldest one is, you know, there's something about numbers that I just don't pay attention to. So people will ask me about my children, and um, I think he's already in his 30s. And then he has two children, and then I have a second daughter. She's in eastern Oklahoma with her family, and I, the youngest one just got married two years ago, and I think she's in her mid-20s. I'm not sure. But everybody is taller than me. I call them my human trees. <laughs> so did they, did they go back to your homeland? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Do they really like doing it? Or? Uh, the middle one, the middle one does. She participates, or she did at one time participate in our uh, feast days, in our dancing that yeah. we do back there. Uh, she, she one day just said, Mom, um, I, would it be okay if I go back and, and dance during the feast? And I was just shocked. Because yeah. uh, she's always been my shy one. Uh, you know, n never, n never really asking anybody for anything. And then all of a sudden she wants to dance. So I said, you know, your grandma and everybody will be so excited. And I called them up. I said, guess what? Catherine wants to come home and dance da -da 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 during feast day. And they said, what? I said, yeah, can we get clothes for her? Yeah, well, tell us what we need to get. So I had somebody make her moccasins for her. And then somebody made her traditional dress underneath and on top and the belt. And, you know, I had jewelry that that I gave to her to use. And then um, I took her back home the day before the big dance yeah. and um, took her to a singer that usually sings and then his wife always dances. They're, she's very good at dancing. Yeah. And they knew Catherine when she was a little girl. So she spent the evening and they went over some songs told her, don't be afraid, there's going to be new songs being introduced this time, so a lot of people have never heard them. And they basically told her how to move, what is the way they're going to move with her partner. Uh -huh. And there's a last song that can get kind of confusing if you don't really know what you're doing. And so they went over that last song with her and how she would move around her partner. 
And that morning, we got her ready. She had to go to the kiva with everybody else. And my sister took care of her while she was there because she was also a part of that. And when she came out for the first time and I saw her, I was like, <laughs> wow. I see, I was, I was afraid for her. You know how mamas get, you know, you just want them to do well. Uh, don't embarrass yourself. You know, just do well, you know, just do well. Yeah. And when I saw her, she was dancing as if she had always done it all her life. And then the littlest one, I said, why don't you get out? And no, I'm not going to get out there. People will look at me, you know. And her sister said, you don't, even, you don't even see the people. Because when you're dancing, you're praying. Yeah. You're praying. You're praying for everybody that comes into your mind. And when it gets really hard, and you're tired, and it's hot, and you're sweaty, that's when you just pray more. You just pray more for strength. So our people. There are people back home every morning that wake up and they pray for you yeah. because you are part of the world. And so they pray for everybody out here in this country, our leaders, whether they like them or not, <laughs> they still pray for them. Yeah. And they pray for everybody. So across Indian country, all of the tribes, they are a prayerful people and they are always praying, not just for their own, but for everybody else in the world. In Especially fact, for rain. <laughs> isn't that actually what the Indian dances are mostly made of? Mm -hmm. A lot of them are, yeah. Uh, even our traditional clothing, it all has to do with bringing the rain. Yeah. 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 And so right. we, know, we know that water is very important. Right. Yes. And that's why they had Standing Rock. You know, up in Standing Rock. That's why it was so important to them that our, the water doesn't get, um, uh, uh, what, it, what would it be? Um, polluted. Polluted, yeah. And, and, and not just from gas and oil, but from other things too. Right. You know, we have to take care of it. It's actually sacred to y'all. Mm, yeah, just about uh, everything is. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, just about everything is, yes, yes. But thank you, I appreciate thank it. You. Thank You're you. Welcome.